Again, you should have been sent an attachment to the email this morning that had this part, uh, handout for the workshop this morning. I encourage you to print it out at your leisure. You can also go on our website and find it there. This workshop's being recorded. So you can also send somebody to, to watch it later on YouTube. So again, there's lots of ways to find the information and the slides that will be in that recording. So uh, welcome aboard. Um, if you have questions throughout the session, uh, please put them in the chat box or in the Q&A. Um, it'll last an hour and a half, two hours this morning, depending on your questions. So feel free to ask questions throughout. Today you have myself and Amber Roberts. Uh, we're gonna be your presenters today. Uh, we're gonna talk to you about what's a fair rental rate for 2021. Again, I'm David Bow. I'm based out of Worthington. I'm also used to the county agent here in Slayton. And this is my email address. This is my cell phone number. We also have Melissa on, on board with us there. She's in the behind the scenes helping us out get with these registrations and people on board. So thanks to Melissa as well today. Um, but I get at least three questions a day about rent year round. So if you have questions later on, you can send me an email or leave a message on my cell phone and I'll get back to you, okay? So <clears throat> we're gonna start today's workshop by asking a question. What do you think is a fair rent for next year? 2021, what do you think is a fair rental rate? What's your rate on your property? And fill in the blank, what do you think is a fair rental rate for your, your property? And there's, you don't have to share with anybody, it's your, your information. If you did print out the handout <clears throat> ahead of time, um, I'm gonna have a few questions I'm gonna talk to you throughout the workshop today. The first question on the inside the front cover is this one. What do you think is a fair rent for your situation? Okay. Well, these are the objectives we're gonna talk about this morning. We're gonna start by talking about uh, rental rate trends. I'll show you some numbers there. We're gonna look at budget for 2021 for corn and soybeans. And I'll tell you that corn and soybeans really control rents in Southern Minnesota. I have one slides in here that really shows that correlation. So we'll talk about that later on. Um, we're gonna utilize FinBin data throughout today's workshop. Um, FinBin data is where farmers who participate with adult farm management programs in MinSKU and Extension put their data in this database. It's really informational. You can see Slayton, Murray County numbers. You can see Nobles County numbers. There's enough farmers to look at their data by county. Uh, Amber and I are gonna discuss mostly regional numbers. We're gonna start from St. Cloud, East and West, South. Um, there's roughly 1,200 farms in that region that are part of the Adult Farm Management Program that I've, I've had fortunate to track since the 1970s. And we've got a lot of data to share with you today about that. So a bigger pool. But if you want to see numbers locally, you can do that too, if you want to pick that county. So FinBin is a great source of data we're going to talk about today. We're also going to examine a couple sources of land values for you to look at, because both farmers and landlords are interested in land values. And then I've got three worksheets in the, in the workshop today, one for the landlord, one for the farmer tenant, one acceptable price worksheet, and Amber's going to walk you through those. And then we're going to visit with you about flexible rental agreements, possibly incorporating that in your situation. I really like flexible rental agreements because they share the risk and reward between the farm and the landlord. And then we'll talk about negotiation at the end for mutual agreements for both parties, mutual benefits. So again, uh, Amber and I are part of the ABM team, Ag Business Management team. And we have a website too on Extensions homepage. You go there and select Learn About, select Managing a Farm, and you'll find lots of information there. So I encourage you to go there after the workshop. You'll find a lot of this on there as well, okay? Uh, one document we post every year, and we're going to look at that part of it first when we start out today, is this document. It's a four-page document, and the university has gone away from PDF files because uh, they want everything to show up on your cell phones today. So, But if you want to see this four-page document as PDF, Amber and I have two bosses on campus, and they work in the Center for Farm Financial Management, and they allow us to post this document as a four-page document as a PDF file, so you can see the document in its Link, link long form on this website. So I'll go there later. The only thing different between extensions website and this is you take out extension and you put CFFM in there and you'll find the publications, okay? So then we go to your handout and skipping the front page, the cover page and start from the inside, every other page, you'll see back front and back on page three, you'll find Southwest Minnesota that includes Murray County. We're, we're at you virtually this morning, uh, posting with those numbers. So on page three, they're by regions in the state and so the third region that's on that page 33, you'll find this section. So if we go across Murray County, this is from 2015, 16, 17, 18. These are the average rents paid by the farmers in the adult farm management program in each of these counties. You see Lincoln had a few years, they had NA in there and so did Rock until 18. That means there were farmers in the associations those years, but not enough to post data. Then you see four counties, 2019, same adult farm management numbers, been been data, but that was the average rent 19, so it went down significantly, $12 an acre from 18 to 19. 
that was the median in this column of the every county. So the median is the very middle rent in the range. So you line up all the rents in Murray County in that database, the very middle rent was $200 an acre. It means half the rents were at $200 or higher and half the rents were $200 and lower because there could have been several $200, the very middle rents in the range was $200. Then you see two columns, one's called the 10th percentile and the 90th percentile. Those are the averages for the bottom 10%. So in Murray County, it was 150. And then the averages for the top 10%, it was 246. So that gives you a range. And those are averages for the top and bottom groups. So there's still rents lower than that, 150, and their rents higher than that, 246. But those are the averages for the bottom 10% and top 10%. And then you see a column that says 2020 NAS data. NAS stands for National Ag Statistics Service. Um, it's part of the USDA. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> they started publishing county rents in 2008. They skipped a few years as recently as 2018, but they did publish them in 2019 and 2020. It comes out in September, fall of each year. So they did a survey. These are actually, the FINMA data comes off the farmer's records. This is done by a survey by the USDA. So for Murray County, they're saying 2020, the average rent was estimated at 192. So you've got two sources of data side by side. A year apart, this is 2019 from the Gulf of Magic Records at 208. And this is a year later, they're saying 192. Then we have a blank here for you to fill your own estimates in. Again, like you did, we started with that first question. On that four page document, it's not in your handout, but this is a shows of the regional numbers. So cumulatively in Southwest Minnesota, for the last five years in FinBen, the rates have gone down 7.6% for crop and rental rates. So a big decline over the, cumulatively over the five years. And last year they went down 0.7%. So not quite 1% a year decline. But we talk about these workshops statewide. Katie and Amber and Nathan and all of us are all across the state working these workshops. So we use statewide numbers to do projections. So you'll see for the state, they went down 7.5% over that five year period. And in the last year, they went down 0.4%, less than a half of 1%. So if you really look at that, that's really no change. A little bit down, but very little change. So if you look at trends, that's zero change. And then we're gonna show you a little bit later, the USDA numbers from the NAS data, statewide numbers again from 19 to 20 were unchanged. Zero, the same number in 19 as there was in 20. So if we're looking at trends going forward and you wanna look at a trend for what rents are doing from 2020 to 2021, right now the current trend would be a flat uh, rate on, on rents. So again, that's just what the trend is right now, both from FinBen and by the USDA's uh, NAS survey. So I got another question for all of you in the audience. So uh, what do you think it costs to produce one acre of corn and one acre of soybeans, including your rental rates and all the input costs? What do you think it costs to produce one acre of corn and soybeans? Just write a number down. Oops, okay. So with that, here's some pictures of corn and soybeans. That's what we have down here in Southern Minnesota. We have other crops, but these are the vast majority of the acres are put in these two crops. So we're gonna focus on these two crops right now for budgets and look at income. So again, um, we're gonna start talking about that. I am gonna put my mic on mute and I'm gonna turn it over to Amber. She's gonna walk you through some, some corn and bean budgets. Let's see if I can yes, I am. And for all of those who joined us a few minutes late, what I'm gonna do for you is stick that handout back in the chat box. So just in case you didn't see it, um, you should now have access to it and we'll talk through those corn budgets. Okay, Dave, uh, next slide, please. So the corn budgets that we're looking at today are for Southern Minnesota. So they're from that FinBin database that David already talked about. And we have uh, about 100, or excuse me, 1,200 farms in this database. Um, so these are where these numbers come from. And the nice thing is, FinBin has a lot of information and Dave has put it together in this budget to help you understand you know, what are those trends that we're seeing? What are we forecasting into 2021? And what has those past values looked like for our corn budget? So that for this left column, you'll see we have different variables. Uh, here we're talking through yield, we're talking through price. We also have gross return per acre. That next set of columns over, this is our range. So what was the highest value that we experienced and the lowest value that we experienced in the last decade? Then we have that average from 2010 to 2019. Our 2019 actual numbers, so that's the year we have the most recent data for. And then you'll see we have two columns where we're showing trends. And that very furthest right column is where we're looking at forecasting into 2021, what does our forecasted budget look like? 
So we'll talk through that forecasted budget primarily. Um, so 2021, looking at yields of 190 bushels per acre and a price of $3.50. You know what, with yields of 190, that puts us above both our 10-year average and above what we've seen in 2019. But $3.50 puts us on the lower end of prices that we've received. When we multiply those together, we get a total product return of $665 per acre. And then normally we would add miscellaneous income. But if you're looking at this for this column, we put a zero in there. And the reason for that is if yields are higher, you're less likely to get you know, a crop insurance payment. Our county PLC um, become less likely when we have those higher yields. The other thing that's included in this miscellaneous income category in FinBIN that we don't know if we'll receive a payment or not is market facilitation payments. Um, so for this category, we've put a zero. Does that mean that in come 2021, we might not receive um, government payments? Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Um, I know 2020, there's been a lot of different programs and Dave will talk through those. But for this budget here, we put a zero with those higher yields, less likely to get crop insurance um, and less likely to get MFP payments. So gross return per acre, $665 forecasting into 2021. Next slide. Here, we're just gonna show you what your direct expenses are. You'll see we cover feed, fertilizer, chemical crops. I uh, wanna highlight here that land rent is also in this budget. Uh, and to get that total direct expense, we're just multiplying all of those direct expenses together. So if you're looking across these expenses, you'll notice they don't change a whole lot over time. And the numbers that we're forecasting into 2021 look pretty similar to what we saw in 2019. So forecasting for our total direct expense, $639 for 2021. You know, that's just a few cents higher than what we actually saw in 2019. And then when we take that direct ex expense and we subtract it from that expected gross income, that leaves us about $26 per acre. So definitely on the lower end. Next slide. Here we're also gonna add in any of those overhead expenses. Um, you'll see we have hired labor, machinery and building leases, any utilities that you might have. And those numbers don't fluctuate a whole lot either. So forecasting into 2021, our total overhead expenses, $96. Uh, that's just a few cents higher than what we saw in 2019 um, and a little bit lower than what we saw for that 10 year average. And Dave will talk about why that's lower um, in some of our future slides. So when we add together our overhead expense and our direct expense, we have a total expense per acre of $735 forecasting into 2021. And then when we subtract that total expense from our gross income, we're looking at a loss of about $70 per acre for corn. So really highlighting why this budget is important and it's important to think through, um, you know, what we expect our 2021 corn budget to look like. Next slide. Okay, but expenses aren't everything, right? So we also need to think about labor and management charges and any government payments that we might receive um, and these are in addition to those government payments that we saw um, earlier. So with the government payments, with that labor and management charge, we're looking at a net return forecasting into 2021 of a loss of $112 per acre. Now that puts us below what we've seen in that 2010 to 2019 uh, range. I just wanna remind you all here that this is average. As farms, you know, there are certain things that your farm does better than others in certain areas where other farms do better. So these are based on the averages and the information that we have for Southern Minnesota. So to ensure that you don't have that $112 loss, what price would you need to get on your corn to hit your break even? Well, if we're including government payments and we're including that labor and management charges, you would need for looking into 2021, a price of $4.10 um, to mitigate any losses and to hit your break even. Next slide. I did want to just mention on your handout, if you do have the handout in front of you, there's one typo that says 8823. It should be 2823. I've corrected it here on the slide, but it's probably wrong in your handout. Just one number that I made a mistake on. So just wanted to point that out. 
Now we're going to talk through the soybean budgets for 2021. Next slide. These look very similar as to how they were set up in the corn budgets, you know, projecting into 2021, forecasting a yield of 52 bushels per acre. That would put us both above what we saw in 2019 and the 10 year trend, a price of $9. That's higher than what we saw in 2019, but lower than that 10 year trend. Um, but definitely closer to the prices that we've seen over the last five years. When we multiply our yield by our price, $468 for our gross return per acre. Next slide. Once again, we've seen this before. We've seen uh, the direct expenses. They don't change a whole lot year over to year. There is definitely some fluctuation, but if you look at that forecasted 2021 total direct expense, that's $400 and $36. That's about $10 higher than what we saw in 2019. Um, and remember that this also includes land rent in here. So we'll be talking about several different ways to calculate what's a fair land rent for you. Um, but you can see here that they're forecasting you know, $2 or $205 here, which is just slightly higher than what we saw in 2019. So when we subtract that total direct expense from our gross income, uh, looks like we would have $32 per acre for 2021. Next slide. But we also need to figure in those overhead expenses. Again, here we have our budgets for overhead expenses and what their that range has been in the last 10 years, what those trends look like. So forecasting into 2021, a total overhead expense of $66. Um, which is just a dollar and some change higher than what we saw in 2019. When we add together that direct expense and our overhead expenses, we get a total expense of $502. And when we take that direct ex or total expense, and we subtract it from our gross income, we're looking at a loss of about $34 per acre. Next slide. But we also need to figure in you know, what's our labor and management charges? What are any additional government payments we might receive? And with both of those, we're still forecasting for 2021 a loss of about $63 per acre. So at that price, or excuse me, at that net return per acre, that puts us below even the lowest value that we saw in that 10 year range. Um, so really highlighting why soybean budgets are important. So what can we do to ensure that we're hitting this break even? Well, for this budget here, to hit that break even, you would need to get a soybean price of $10.21. Next slide. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, we, you know, we talk about prices a lot and how to use the right price for a budget because the price in 2020 has varied a lot. We started about $3 corn and we went down below $3 for a long time. Then we now we're closer to $4 corn and bean market did the same roller coaster rides up to $11 beans. And we were under $9 for two years previously. So what's the price estimate for use the total year? What's the average the farmer's gonna get to use for their budgets or their actual numbers for 2020? Same for soybeans. Just put a number in that, fill in the blanks there if you have an estimate of what we should use for the current price for corn and soybeans. Okay. If you go back to the handout, this is on page uh, six in your handout. These are the cash prices in Warrington, uh, New Vision Co-op in Warrington, going back a long time period. So on your handout, I can I actually have more years than I can put on your handout anymore because there's so many rows. But from 1975 to 2019, I've got those numbers and each column, the first column is the high price for corn in Warrington that year. The middle column is the average for the year. So we've got a high of 19 of $4.37. The average was 373 and the low during the year was $3.35. So it gives you the high, low, average and low. Same for soybeans. The high price was under $9.889. The average is only $8.14 and the low is $7.41. So that gives you some numbers. For the 10 year average, here's, here's the range, much higher numbers because we had several years we averaged above $6 and we have several years, four years where it averaged above $12. So they really impacted these, these numbers down the bottom. But if I look at the last five year average, if I average up these one, two, three, four, or five and average those numbers out since 15, how close, what do you think the number would average out for those five years? 
actually about three dollars and thirty six cents. So when I use three fifty for a budget, well, that's realistic. We use three fifty for a budget too because that's where the prices were. I put those budgets together for two thousand twenty one corn. If you go over to soybeans, look at the last five year average. What do those five year averages add up? To, average out to eight dollars and seventy nine cents. So again. Not the nine dollars we put in the budget, but current prices are above nine dollars. When did the budget together nine dollars was kind of where two thousand twenty one soybeans were. So I guess some price numbers. Here's the current, or actually, this is from the fourteenth. This is from Schmidt Grain here in Slayton. You can see their bids, their cash bids, their basis, and the contract month. So the contract month we're using right now is March from corn. This is how much is under that futures price to get these cash bids. So you can see not quite four dollars. Yesterday we were. Um, we had a $4 bid over here and the base was that much better. So it varies across the state in these bases of what's under the futures market. And then we go new crop out here and it gets around close to that 350 or 356. So the basis gets wider and the price goes down from the March contract of 21 to December contract of 21. So between the two of those combinations, we're pretty close to that 350 price for corn right now at uh, Schmidt Grain here in Slayton. Here's the soybean market for Schmidt Grain. And again, we're over $11. Again, you see the January contract we're using, this is 64 cents under. This is what happened the day of the last day of that trade. You go to new crop, we're not even $10. So we lose over about $1.20, $1.19 we drop. And majority of that, there's, there's some of that is in basis, 11 cents, but majority of that is the price drop of over a dollar between January contract and new crop bid next year. So it gives you an idea of where we are. So even think about $11 beans today, it's good, but how much beans are available to sell today, $11? And we go next year, look at the budget, you know, maybe today I do use uh, 950 or something, but when I did the budget again, this number was close to the $9 and it was this 984. So how do you look at 2020 results? Well, numbers vary a lot, uh, lots of variables. First of all, yields. We've been doing these workshops across the state and I've heard a lot of very interesting yields this year. I've heard we're in Southwest Minnesota, we had, much better planting season than we did in 2019. We weren't near as wet in the spring, so we got the crop planted on time in most places. We were a little wet some places, but most places got the crop planted much better than 2019. But unfortunately in Southwest, we actually dried out towards the end of the year. Those rain showers got fewer and fewer and spottier and spottier, so some of our crops dried up and some areas, some farmers only got 120 bushel corn. Even some of the good areas where they had good yields, some windstorms came through and knocked it down. I heard of a, a farmer in a, in a really good county that had a windstorm and he only got 120 bushel corn in his field for an average because that windstorm came through. So yields vary. And then on the other side, I've heard as high as 270 in Minnesota. So that's a big difference from 120 to 270. Makes a big impact on how the results turn out. On beans, I've heard 30 bushels to 70 bushels. Government payments, uh, as Amber talked about in 2019, they had a market facilitation program payment, which added a lot of money to the farmer's pocket. Well, this year they've actually had five different programs here in South, Southern Minnesota that they could have added their pocket, and I'll discuss those later, but there's many different programs that have come out in 2020. And prices, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but we started around $3, we were below $3 for a long time. And then in second week of August, both corn and beans really took off. But by then, if you listen to Ed Ossett's, our green marketing special on campus, you're supposed to have your green price by July 1st. That's kind of his 11th commandment. So if you did have your green sold before then, you really had much lower prices. So you know, think about all those variables. What do you think the farmer's profits are gonna be in 2020 crop on rented acres? What do you think per acre they're gonna make for money this year? Fill in the blank for both corn and beans. What's your estimate? Okay. And again, you don't have to share this with anybody. It's your, your worksheet. So just fill in your numbers. Okay. Well, here's some examples. This is just to walk through the kind of just straight things to think about. So in 2020, when I did these, these rent talks a year ago, I had expenses of $743 for corn and $483 for soybeans without any labor costs. If I use good yields, so people that did get some rain and did get above average yields, so 200 bushel corn and 55 bushel beans are good crops. Um, I use those yields. And when I did this slide set, the price of, for corn was 370, the price of beans was 990. So that's the income, 760 on corn and uh, 544 for soybeans, minus my expenses, I have $70 an acre profit on corn and $61 an acre on soybeans. If I have 50-50 crop rotation, that average price is $39.25. Now, that's not including government payments. And I have, I have four, market, four marketing groups I meet with farmers monthly. And one of them, we've gone through and did a survey of all the farmers, what they got for these five different programs. And some of the farmers only got $11 an acre 
and some of the farms got close to $100 an acre. So again, every farmer is not the same. The results for the programs vary a lot, but there's a big variance in there, but that's not including these numbers yet. So they even have bigger numbers to add in this government payment in. If I use higher yields, some farmers that did get rain had higher yields, uh, used 220 corn and 65 bushel beans, the same expenses, the same prices, and they're gonna make a profit 126.75 an acre. So again, there's lots of variables. If I use lower prices, like I talked about earlier, if they sold their crop before July 1st, they might have averaged these 330 and 850. I use those prices in this 200 bushel corn and 55 bushel beans expenses. They're going to lose money up here with before government payments. And my second example of 220 and, and 65, they're going to make 26 to 25. But in all those examples, we didn't include government payments. Okay, so government payments are really going to help a lot of farmers' bottom line this year. Again, those five those five program payments, the farm bill is what we typically see. And on those budgets, the government payments we included are from the farm bill. Those are the ARC County payments, which are, they take the county average yields times the marketing average price compared to Olympic average for those numbers and figure out if they get a payment or not. In Southwest Minnesota, in 2019, when they get the payments and harvest in 2020 for that year, in 2019, we had prevented plant, 30% of the acres in some counties didn't get planted. Uh, we had low, lower plant or late planting dates, so we had lower yields. You'll see that show up a little bit later when I show you yields. But so we had maximum Art County payments down here in Southwest Minnesota and a few counties, and some counties got some, but other counties in the state got none. On the soybeans, a similar program for the Art County, um, but they also could sign up for price loss coverage. That was two programs, either Art County or price loss coverage, which they take it against the benchmark price and they get these, if it's lower than that, the marketing average price, they get a payment. For soybeans, they didn't get a payment for price loss coverage. For corn, if they went that route, they would have got 12 cents a bushel for their program acres. So, um, there was a payment for the farm bill in 2019 on corn for, for the people who did the price loss coverage. The CARES Act is the next program discussed down here. Um, the Trump administration decided that when they negotiated with China has kept the price of corn and soybeans so low for quite a little while. Farmers were suffering. And in fact, from 2014 through 2018, these 1,200 farms on average lost money on corn for those five years in a row. So they... Uh, passed this CARES Act, which gave a direct payment to farmers to help them uh, recur or re regroup some of those losses. Some other programs out there is WIP payments for 18 and 19. Normally those payments are uh, associated with flooding or with hurricanes, um, but they did extend it to our wet conditions we had. So it, it made me bond just include uh, heavy water loss conditions. So if you were in a county like we were eligible down here in Nobles and in Murray for this WIP payment. And so you're in a county that was declared a disaster or next to a county that was declared a disaster and had loss of yields. They could apply for this WIP program payment, which really was um, like a crop insurance payment. So they get their crop insurance payment and this WIP payment kind of give them a higher level of coverage. So if they, if they had a loss of crop, the WIP payments could, they could have been applied through the FSA Farm Service Agency to get additional payments, USDA. Another program you, you probably all heard about is called PPP or the Paycheck Protection Program. That was for small business and farmers were included in that, which accounted for their, um, if they have employees or their own wages, if they had lost income, they could apply for this PPP program. It was a loan and you would, uh, if you had 24 months of wages, they, could, they would get through the program as a loan. And if they did pay it for their income or their wages, uh, they would be able to apply for that to turn into from a loan to a grant or a forgiven loan. So again, that's another source of money. And then at the end of the year, uh, they came up with the CARES Act too, right around election time. So there's five different programs, which again, between my one working group, which is kind of localized around one area, and they're in a few different counties, but again, they varied from $11 to almost $100 of accumulation of those five programs. So not everybody's the same. So it's kind of hard to talk about uh, one number. The FinBin data, again, is a great source of data. Uh, you'll see those, those programs, the farm bill will come again on the government payments and all the other four will probably again go under miscellaneous income. So again, that'll be how it will show up in 2020 budgets next year when they get those actual numbers put in. But Amber and I talk about averages a lot and none of us are average. Some of us are better at things than poorer at things, but we, average numbers don't necessarily describe us. So I would, everything I've used so far is averages. So you can look at the variation of data by looking at this website. This is FinBin data, this is the database. First thing you click is the green bar under crops and you'll find corn on cash on the ground. And you can pick Murray County if you like to, you can pick any county around here except, and even Rock you can do right now for looking at those budgets regionally and compared to our 1200 farms. 
You can also pick on this red bar and called crops, and it's called the benchmark report. So what that looks like is the next slide. On page seven of your handout, you'll see this, and there's lots of numbers. I'm sorry for the small print, but I just want you to think about the concept. So this is what a benchmark report looks like. In South of Minnesota Extension Program, we have 211 farms, so they would get this report with my farm compared to their, their peers of 211 farms. But this throws the whole state of Minnesota for 2019 who raised corn in the adult farm management program. So what this shows my farm against my peers of the whole state. So the first column is one farm's actual numbers in each row, okay? The second column is the median of the, each row. So each row is unique and they line up by their values in the, in the first one is yield. So they line up lowest yield to highest yield and the very middle value in the yield row is 179.01. Oh, so that means half the yields are higher than that and half the yields are lower than that. There could have been several 179.01s, but that's the very middle value in the row, okay? Then you see a count. That's the number of farms. So there were 3,749 farms. So in the total, total database for the raised corn in 2019. So these next columns, 10 to 100%, are 10% groups of that row. So if you think about 10% of this count, we're talking about roughly 375 farms in either one of these columns. Okay, so 375 farms, 10% of them, in the bottom end of the row count for this yield, average about 111 bushels. Next group, next 10%, 375 farms, average 140. And the top group averaged 223. So we know layers are higher than that in the yield database, and their yields lower than that, but those are the averages, the bottom 10% and top 10%, and the rest of them are the average for those groups. Okay, next line is value per unit. So the sample farm had a value per unit of 378. It's what they sold their crops for for 2019 plus the ending value, any stock value. The, the median was 370. Again, we've got the same number of count. So 10% of the farms, 375 farms got 325 for their corn, and 10% of the farms got 390 for the corn. So a big variation between the two. Okay, so you take the, the yield times the price, and again, they take those numbers and average, put it on a standard line, and you'll see the numbers range from the bottom 10% here to the top 10%. Hedging accounts, the count really changed here. So this is gain or losses in the hedging account. Only 133 farms had a hedging account with an income or a loss. So every 10% now represents how many farms? 13 farms. So 13 farms lost $58, and 13 farms made $50.50. Our sample farm did have a hedging account. He made $5.40 an acre. The median was 1915. Next line is crop insurance. Again, usually most years, that's the majority of the crop insurance. But this last year, 19 numbers, we had the market facilitation program that shows up here in other crop income. So you can see how much more of that was in crop insurance. But look at all the numbers here. Only 1,300 farms got a crop insurance payment. So again, this is a little over a third of the count got a crop insurance payment. In order to get that, they probably had, they might have a yield loss or they might have a revenue loss because they can buy revenue protection. So that income went from $340 per acre to $272 an acre for crop insurance. Well, the person that got 223 bushel of corn didn't get that crop insurance payment. They're more likely to got the 110 or less. So again, what I want to tell you is the same farmer is not in this column, and not all the way down this column, or all the way down this column. Every line they lack uniquely. And that's kind of shown in the highlighted cells. This is what the farmer gets to the metric report is their numbers are highlighted in each row where they would fall. So in yield, he's in the 60% group. In the price, he's in the 70% group, same with total revenue. And he's in the bottom 50%. He's in the 40% for uh, hedging accounts and crop insurance, he's in 30 and 40% for other income. So this shows you the market facilitation program payments, how they varied that year. But so see how the farmer changed in each row for good, good, bad. So on expenses, it's just the opposite. They're listed the highest expenses first, the lowest. So they want the lower expenses, they want the higher income and higher yield, but they want lower input costs. So Again, as a farmer, I'd like to see my numbers highlighted in the top half, 60 to 100%. And then the bottom half, maybe those are areas I can work on. So on one of his, he's in the bottom third for his seed cost. He's in the bottom half for his fertilizer cost. He's doing pretty good on all the other costs that are highlighted in the, in the, in the lower numbers. His rents in the bottom third again, though, for high numbers, you see the range in rents. Um, you see his return over direct expenses. You see your net return. But it looks down here, you see a total cost breaker. That's a really interesting number. So again, the count. 350 farms roughly per 10%. So all those 375 farms had an expense of almost $900 an acre. Almost $900 an acre. Where the cheapest 375 farms had an expense of like $438 an acre. Less than half. So when we talk averages, I want you to talk, you're talking to the individual farmers and negotiations, everybody's situation is unique and different. Big variations out there. If you go down a little farther to net return over labor management, again, 375 farms lost an average of $239 an acre and 375 farms made $235 an acre. Look at that big range. 
and half of them lost money and half of them made money in that, that role. You go here, the cost of production for labor and management. This is based on a bushel. So they line up with their expenses, divide by the extra bushels. This is what they need to sell their crop for to pay their bills. Our simple farm needed $3.79 or 97 cents. Um, he only got 378, so what happened? They lost $34 an acre. So the bottom 10% needed $5.44. Next group needed $4.56 and so on. So we get way up here, the cheapest could get by with 238 to make money. So if I use similar yields and similar expenses from 19, looking forward to 2021, and I use a 350 price, they would make money, they would make money, they would make money, they would make money, and they would make money based on our current prices right now for 2021 uh, corn. We're just above that 350 you know, price. So these 50% would make money and 50% would lose money, kind of where we were in 2019. That's an informative line. We go to the bean table, same chart. Um, we've lost a few counts. We didn't, not everybody raises beans because we have dairy farmers in the database and not all of them have a cash crop of beans. They put their, all their cropland in their, in their livestock. So again, 10% of the groups, you see how those numbers vary in each row. You see, just like before, the yield is really variable. Uh, hedging accounts are very few numbers. The market facilitation programs are a big number again in 2019 on beans. Look at the total cost per acre, 606 for the bottom 10%. 239 for the top 10%, less than half again. You look at the income, 40% uh, lost money, 60% made money, a little better than corn. You go on to the price number, our sample farm needed $8.52 per bushel to pay the bills. They got 86, so guess what? They made money. But the bottom 10% needed 12.77, the next group needed 10.55, next group needed 9.58, and the next group needed 8.86. We never got above $9 beans, so we know these three groups lost money. And some of the, in here didn't, the average is this number. So some of these had less than $9 prices here through that price change of the group. So again, I use $9 beans, looking forward, one, two, three, 70% would make money and 30% would lose money based on the 19 results. Input cost trends, what are they gonna do next year? Are they gonna stay the same? Are they gonna go down? Are they gonna go up? What do you think? Another chance for you to fill in the blank. All right. Well, will they stay the same? Well, farmers lost money on corn, these 1,200 farms, from 2014 through 2018. They've been looking for ways to lower costs. They actually lowered their costs over that whole time frame, and they're trying to keep their costs the same or lower. So there's a lot of incentive for them to keep their costs the same. Well, they go down. Well, one of the items they've really been cutting back on was seed costs. If a farmer buys the latest and greatest traits and stacks, the cost goes up but they've been not buying all the, those technology traits, so they've been trying to lower the cost. And fertilizer had been going down, but increased again. They went up in 19, they'll probably go up a little bit, or stay the same in 20. So again, to each individual item, I could answer yes to. And the reason why they might go up in 2021 is because they lost money through 18, they made a little money in 19, they're gonna make more money in 20. So as farmers make money, and the suppliers have been controlling their costs for the last several years, what's gonna happen to their costs? They're probably gonna go up, okay? Just because, They've had to control their, pull their line for the last several years. What are the three biggest factors to profitability for the farmer? Well, the first one is cost. We just talked about some of the input costs, but what's the biggest input cost for the farmer? It's land rent. It's historically about a third of the cost, input cost on, on the corn budget goes to rent and about 40% for soybeans. So that's a, what's the biggest cost factor? It's rent. So if they wanted to, this is a big topic for both parties to think about. Yields. They don't want to in, cut their input costs if they affect their yields, but we had a very big variable this year, like I talked about earlier. I've heard 120 to 270 and 70 bushels to, to 30 bushels, so big ranges. So they want to try to keep their yields potential out there if they can. And prices. Here's 2019 numbers for this time last year, what we've done for the year. We had a low of 348 to a high of this. Well, this year we've had a low of like 270 and we haven't hit 416 yet. And that 740 is probably the right price for a low, but our top price here is $11 some. So again, 20, we're similar to this, but not a little, little different. Input cost trends, if you want this 10 year trend, which we're showing you here in this slide, for the last 10 years, these 1200 farms, the database, have their input costs have gone up about 1%, 0.9% a year. So I could take my 2020 cost, add 1% and have an estimate for 2021, just by using that trend. Because this was the cost per acre in 2010, this is the cost per acre in 2000, that was high in 2013, here's where we were in 2019. It had gone down five years until increasing in, in 19, it'll probably go up in 20. And for soybeans, it had gone up a rate of 2.3% over that 10 year period. So again, I might take 3%, around 3%, take my 2020 cost times 
3% increase. I have an estimate. This was a number in 2010, 2014, and 2019. They'd gone down four times in the past 10 years, though, even put costs for soybeans. Here's a simple budget for you here. We've got the yields we talked about, those early budgets that Amber went through. We've got the prices we talked about. I've got a little more government payments here. I got MFP, that was 19 numbers. We've got different programs in 20. I have no, no idea what's gonna be in 20, 21. We've got a new administration. Let's see what happens. Prices are better. So our costs are way up and our budgets, our deficits are way up. So we'll see what happens. But I've increased $15 in this example. Here's the input costs for corn and beans. Here's a $40 for the farmer and all their expenses are paid at that point. Here's left over for their land cost. $110 per acre on corn, $146 on soybeans. If you take those two add numbers and add them together, you get 256 divided by two, what's the rental rate? 128. How many people in the room or on this webinar think that's a fair rate? The farmers do, because that's the budget. You know, you can raise the price of, of beans by another 50 cents up here, and that would make this $25 higher. So I'd raise it rent about $13. So again, still isn't very nice numbers, but that's a realistic number today, looking at the current situation. Here's the rental rate trends from USDA. Again, they start publishing the numbers usually in September each year. You go to the NAS website, nass.usda.gov. You select Minnesota, and you select uh, county publications, and you'll find this table under, under, and this shows you the cropland rental rates. So in two, this, in two, this is overall, the rental rate was 170 and 16, went down to 166 and 17, went up to 167, 18, and then it's been 164 the last two years, no change. Irrigated grounds, it was the flat, then jumped up two years, then it dropped a lot from 19 to 205 to 18 at 188. And most of us have non-irrigated cropland, dryland cropland, and you see the trend similar to overall, but the last two years has been 163. Again, so what's the trend from this data source? Zero, no change for the last year in the database. Looking forward, I would project a zero change in rents. If you have pasture ground, um, we were 30 for two years, we increased 31. And then in 19, it went down to three to 28, and 20 went down by four to 24. So that just shows you overall, they're saying the trend in pasture rates is going down. About the whole state numbers, they do have a one page document to show by county numbers. So again, we're in Murray County today in Slayton. You can see in 2019, the cropland rental rate was 189 in the USDA numbers. It increased to 192 in 2020, so we had a $3 an acre increase overall, and the region had a $1 an acre decrease. So again, this is how they work together. So you have different trends right there between the county numbers and the regional numbers. If you had pasture ground in Murray County, say in 2019 it was $57, and in, re in 2020 it went down to $54.50. So it went down uh, two and a half dollars there, but regionally it went up a dollar and a half. So again, you got kind of contrasting numbers for the county compared to the regional numbers. But you see different counties, you can find this publication on that NAS website as the rest of the state. So land values. What do you think the trend in land values are? Are they going up? Are they going down? Are they remaining the same? Well, I get calls from all over. We had, we've had people from Portland, Oregon on this workshops. We've had North Carolina. Um, I, I get a call, I've had calls from Spain. All those people own land in Minnesota and they want to trends for land values too. So I've had one landlord call me one year. One year he had five state land in five different states. So he might answer yes to multiple ones, but you should answer yes to at least one of these, these, these slides or questions. Here's the USDA again, the NAS data. This is what they're saying. The blue bar, the cropland value is cropland sale prices in solid blue. This is what they were in 2011 for a statewide number. It was below uh, 3,500, a little bit above 3,000. And then you see how it increased dramatically up to 14, and it's kind of been varying a little bit and going down slightly the last couple of years. The, the stripe bar with, a, with white and dark blue, that's the pasture value. That's the pasture sale prices. They've been going up and they kind of been staying a little bit fluctuating, but pretty flat since 15. And the light blue bar is your assessed values. So that's the assessed values of the county assessors. And your county assessors are supposed to keep your assessed values within 95% of the current sale prices. So you can see the light blue and the dark blue are pretty well mirrored image of each other, aren't they, over that time frame? And you can see what the numbers look like for the last few years. This is also on that website, um, NAS website. In 16, here was the average cropland sale price. It increased in 17, increased in 18. Um, it went down in 19, and it went down a little bit in 20 to 4,800. So you see the high was 49.50 for a statewide number. Pasture values, they started at 1680, increased again in 2018 to 75.50. They've gone down last year's to 1680. Look at the assessed values. Here we were about $50 difference. Here we were $50 difference. Here we were $100 difference. But these are all lower, and all of a sudden here we've gone higher 30, and here we're higher 40. 
So they're pretty close to each other to marry each other going forward. So again, I've got a question for everybody in the audience. So how do you, how do you determine a fair rent? What's, how do you, what is the fair rent? It's kind of a challenging question to figure out every year, isn't it? How do you get to that number? So with that, I'm gonna let Amber walk you through three worksheets to help you with your analysis. Great, thanks Dave. So the first worksheet we're gonna talk about here is the landlord's worksheet. You have it in your handout as well as you can find it online at our website. Next slide. So if you're a landlord, this will help you to think through, you know, what is your desired rent per acre? And how we do that is we start by figuring out what's your total desired rent and then dividing that by the number of acres that you have. So we have an example here. You can also plug in your own farm's numbers um, to figure out what your desired rent is. And then from the tenant stance, it can help you to understand, you know, why, what, what might your landlord want when it comes to desired rent. So you'll see in this example here, we're gonna put in our farm size and then the value per acre. So for this example farm, 156 acres with a value of $6,500 per acre. So that gives them a total farm value of just over a million dollars. Now there's a lot of things that you can do with a million dollars, right? This land as a landowner is an asset, right? You could sell that land, take the million dollars and put it in the stock market. You could use it towards retirement. Um, you could take a very nice vacation. So there's a lot that you could do with a million dollars. So we wanna make sure that as a landowner, you are getting some return on investment. Now, Dave has seen this number vary all the way from 1% um, upwards to 5%. We use 2.5. Maybe that's not right for your farm. Maybe you're renting to a grandchild or to your son or daughter. You want to give them a head start and 2% is an okay return or maybe 3%. Um, but figure out what's your desired return on investment. And then we're going to add that desired return on investment with any real estate taxes. Those can differ um, county to county. Those can also differ um, year to year. So we've allocated about $50 here for real estate taxes per acre, add in any liability insurance that you might have and any other cash costs. You'll notice here for our example, they put a zero in cash costs. Um, this could include, you know, if you have a building that you need to run electricity to, any repairs that you might need to make on this land. In this example, perhaps the landlord, as part of their agreement with their tenant, the tenant takes care of any of those repairs and upkeep. So we'll add together that desired return on investment, those taxes, liability insurance, and any cash costs to get our total desired return. For our example, that's just over $33,000. And then we'll take whatever that desired return is and divide it by the number of acres that you have. So for our landlord here, $213.78 is their desired rent per acre. Next slide. We've given you another example here where their desired rent per acre um, is a lot lower. For this farm, they're only about 140 acres and the value per acre is $3,500. Um, so not quite as prime farmland as we saw in that first example. You know, that gives them about half a million dollars in total farm value. A lot that you can do with half a million dollars. The nice thing about farmland is it is a pretty consistent investment. Um, with a 2.5% return, they're getting $12,000. So we'll add together their return on investment, their taxes, liability insurance, and then any other costs, which gives this example farm a total desired return of just over $16,000. When we divide that by the number of acres that they have, uh, desired rent per acre of $115. So this is a good worksheet if you're a landowner and perhaps you haven't updated your land rent in several years to figure out what's that desired rent per acre. Next slide. Now we need to view it from the tenant's point, right? So we saw landowner, this is what I want, but this worksheet, this operator's cash rent worksheet will help you if you're a tenant to figure out after I have um, paid off, or excuse me, after I have figured out what all of my expenses are, what do I have left to pay for rent? Next slide. We'll go through some of this quickly because we've seen a lot of this before. Here you're gonna put in um, 
how big your farm is. In this example farm, they have 100 acres of corn and 100 acres of soybeans for a total of 200 acres. We also want to figure out what is your expected government payments? For this example farm, they're expecting $8 per acre for both corn and soybeans. So that would give them an expected payment of $1,600. You can put in your farm's numbers here. And then are there any other additional payments that you think you might receive? Next slide. So once we put in that information, we've seen this part of the crop budget before, we wanna figure out what's your total income for your corn, what's your total income for your soybeans per acre. So we're gonna take that yield times that expected price to get that total income number. For corn, it's 665. Next slide. And then we're also gonna figure out those direct expenses. We've seen this budget before. We're gonna to add together all of our direct expenses to get that total direct expense per acre. For corn in this example, it's $449. Next slide. We also need to add in our overhead expenses and figure out what our total expense is. We had a question come in on your value per acre. You have not adjusted the value for selling costs or taxes that would be subtracted if the land is sold. Okay. Okay. So wait, she's going back to the landlord worksheet, I'm mm -hmm. sure. So, um, that's just an example for a worksheet and that value is it's your worksheet. You can put in what, what the sale prices are right now, less your tax you're gonna pay on it. You could put in, um, you could put in uh, what you actually paid for it, what was the price when you inherited, because that's really your basis that you, that you have on that land. Um, you could put uh, the assessed values on your tax statements or you can put the fair market value. Um, and that $6,500 that we're gonna show you later comes from the sales of Southwest South Minnesota land averages. So. That number is just a guideline for you. you can put whatever number you want in that worksheet you know, to follow with your question. The question was about um, that along those lines. The value it didn't account for taxes and different things. Well, it does. Um, the taxes are also uh, on the worksheet. You'll see it says we we discuss homestead versus non homestead. That's a big variable in your property taxes too. And uh, I've heard of as high as one hundred three dollars an acre on property taxes for a non homesteaded farmland. So again, we're just giving you guidelines to fill in the blanks. Okay. Sorry to interrupt, Amber. Go right ahead. Oh, great. Thanks, Dave. And thank you for the question. If you have more, drop them in the chat box. Um, so what we're doing here, we're going to figure out those total expenses and subtract our total expenses from our gross income to get a net return. So for corn, we're looking at a net return of $95 and for soybeans, $131. We've seen these before in our previous budgets, um, so nothing too tricky there. Next slide. This is the new part that we haven't seen. So what they're doing here is they're figuring out what is our total return and how much is left over for land rent. So we'll wanna figure out what's your total corn return by taking that net return per acre and multiplying it by the number of acres we have. Same with soybeans. And then we'll add in any government payments that you expect and any other form of payments that you think you might have. So for this example farm, they have a total return of $24,200. And when they divide that by their 200 acres, that leaves them $121 available for rent. Now you can go through and put in your own numbers here to get an idea of what do you have available for rent. And these can fluctuate a lot. So for an example, and what you'll see if you have the handout with you, if instead of $8, per acre, we got zero in government payments, what's available for rent would go down significantly to only $113 per acre. But if we had $65, then what's available for rent per acre would go up to $178. So it can fluctuate a lot depending on those numbers that you put in. Next slide. All right, this slide just shows you kind of where the futures markets are trading. Um, this was done December 13th. Uh, so we, we do this every day, so I don't update it kind of once a week I do this for the, the talks. So December 20th corn, uh, 2020 corn was trading at $4.24. Again, that's the futures price. And we talk about that basis, usually a negative number to give you the cash price, just under $4. Um, and then we go to next year's crop price of December 21, you can see there's a 12 cent drop. 
between 20, December 20 corn, December 21 corn. It gets a little higher in July, but then it gets worse going farther out 22 and 23. And they can actually sell their corn for 24 if they want right now in the future on the board. And it'd be a very similar price as little shown there. And then soybeans, November beans are gone. The contract's gone. They do it before harvest, but now we're using January contract for the nearby contract based on our cash price off of that 11.60 futures. And you saw the price was over $11 locally. So that was on a 60 cent basis. And new crop bid though, from 21, we go from 11.60 to 10.52. So you lose a dollar eight in the futures and the basis got wider. So that's why the price is so much poor going looking at, at the 21 bean price compared to the cash price today. And you see the price gets worse the farther out we go. Here's a way to look at the charts. This shows you the prices that varies throughout the year. So you see the bottom, this is the calendar year. This is the start of the year was 2000, this was January. We started here at about a little bit about $4 futures, which translates usually a 50 cent basis, means we had three, three, uh, 350 corn price, which was a good price. But what happened since then through May, it went down. And normally um, we start low at that time, work our way up a little bit gradually, or and go down some. But usually in May, we start rallying, and we did have a rally. Went up a little bit from a bottom to a, to a high back to about, th about 370, 360 plus, which means we had above $3 corn again for a while. But then it dropped again to a low here in August. It's the second week of August. The low was $3.20. So um, our marketing guru at us would tell us to sell, price our crop before the, the 1st of July. So here we go. We, we had time, all this time in here below $3 cash. Okay. And then since the second week of August, we've had this nice big rally of over a dollar rally in the corn market. Okay, this is 21 corn, or this is 20 corn, here's 21 corn. Similar patterns, uh, it's the chart, uh, but not quite as dramatic, not as low and not as high, okay? And so normally I tell you we'd see a, like a gradual swoop and grow up and like this and then go down after the 4th of July. If you look at that chart, it's almost just the opposite of what normal is. So it was a usual year um, in the markets for pricing. Soybeans. This is the high levels back here in May or um, in the first of the year. And, and we hadn't, you kind of need $10 future price to get to the $9 beans across the state as the basis varies. So we, we haven't had that $9 price cash price for a long time, even all the way up here until we had the $10 here till end of September. In September, we got $10 beans. So we had a long time to wait for $9 and now we're $11 cash. So being a big rally, we did rally a little bit going starting in May, but really took off again the second week of August here with prices, okay? And this is the next year's crop, the harvest in November 21, a similar pattern where at high levels, but not to the high levels we were, we're about a dollar lower, a little over a dollar lower than the 20 uh, bean prices. So we worked through a couple of budgets with you earlier, Amber did, and we came to a number of what their break even prices and sell their crops for to pay all the bills. Uh, what do you think it is for the farmers in 21? What do you think their break-even price is? What should they use for a target price to get for the corn and beans to pay their bills? Uh, what do you think it is? There's no wrong answer. Just fill in the blank there and we'll go forward. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Amber. She's going to walk you through another worksheet to help you figure out that what that number might be. Great. Next slide, please. So like Dave said here, we're going to help you figure out which your number is. We already gave you some estimates earlier using that forecasted 2021 budget, but those are based on averages. And as we had mentioned, some farms do better in certain areas than others. Um, so we'll help you figure out for your particular crops, what is that acceptable price that you need to get? We'll start again. These are pretty simple budgets. You can put in your farm's numbers to figure out what your farm needs. In this example farm we'll talk through, we have 500 acres of corn and 500 acres of soybean, so a thousand acre farm with a 50-50 split. We're then going to figure out what that total income per acre is. We've seen this in previous budgets, so we'll multiply that yield 190 times a price of 350 and add $30 in government payments. Next slide. Direct expense per acre, nothing surprising here. We've seen this before. We'll add together all of our direct expenses. And I just wanna make a note in this budget, we'll also include land rent into those direct expenses per acre. Next slide. Then we'll have you put in your overhead expenses and get that total expense number. So we'll add together our overhead expenses and our direct expenses. And for corn in this example, it's $744 per acre. 
Now this is where things look a little different than what we've seen in previous budgets. We're trying to figure out what is our total expense to grow all of our crops and to live our lifestyle. And from that, we'll, figure, we'll be able to determine what our price is. So they wanna figure out what's the total corn expense and what's the total soybean expense. So we'll take that expense per acre that we calculated and multiply it by the 500 acres of corn and multiply it by that 500 acres of soybeans in this example. So for our farm crop expense for corn, $372,000. For soybeans, $254,500. Next slide. We also need to figure out how much of our uh, income do we need to generate from our row crops. So in this example here, 60% of their income is derived from their row crops, and they have a family living expense of $85,000. So that would give them a living expense allocated to row crops of $51,000, or about $51 per acre. Now I wanna make a few notes here as you're doing this. Uh, estimating family living costs or expenses, excuse me, is notoriously difficult. And we tend to underestimate, myself included, um, how much we actually spend on our family living costs. So really try and give an accurate estimate um, because we want to make sure that you can continue to maintain living the lifestyle uh, that you are living. Another thing here, your proportion of income derived from row crops, it might be 100%. If you are a 100% corn and soybean farm, you and your spouse would both work full time on the farm, then this 60% might be 100 for you. Um, so just thinking through that. And as a note, average family living cost is about 60 to $70 per acre uh, here in Minnesota. Next slide. So then to get that price calculation, like I said, we're gonna figure out what our net expense is. So we'll add together that crop, it, expense, we'll add together our living expenses and we'll subtract any expected payments we might have. So for this corn example, $372,000 to grow 500 acres of corn. We took that family living cost of 51,000 and divided it in half. Uh, so 200, or excuse me, 25,500 is allocated towards corn. And then this expected payment comes from that $30 of government payments that we got. So when we add those together and subtract our expected payments, we get a net expense of $382,500. And for corn, we have 500 acres with 190 bushels per acre that we're expecting. So that gives us 95,000 bushels to cover our net expense of $382,000. So when we take that net expense, we divide by our expected yield for all of our corn, we get a price of $4.03. So that's the price in this example that our corn farmer would need to get $4.03 in order to hit their break-evens. For soybeans, $10.19. And if you think back to what we talked about in those forecasted 2021 budgets, these are pretty close to those numbers that we saw earlier. Next slide. All right, now we're going to go back into some rental rate trends. Again, you can find a lot of this information on our, our webpage and extension. We have a statewide map, so people can click on the county you're interested in, and you can find that information there as well. And there's also a spreadsheet. Um, the, the USDA uh, National Statistics Service, again, I talked about either the nas.usda.gov, and click on their website and find rental rate information. It usually comes out in September each year. They do regional numbers, so it's a kind of busy chart, but in Southwest Minnesota, we're right here. It was 20, it went down a dollar, supposedly by the region from 196 in 2019 to 195 in 2020. Shows you the trend for regional numbers. Pasture grant went up a dollar fifty, but you saw in Murray County there was a stop to the state, the regional numbers. Um, and you see irrigated ground has been published since 2014. But for the whole state, they really stay the same. 163, the trend is flat. Um, if you had irrigated ground, uh, you know the average crop on really declined this different years. But you see four years of out of the last six, we have declines and two years, no change. So really um, prediction of flat numbers going forward by that trend. Irrigated ground declined from 205 and 19 to 288 and 20. And pasture ground has been declining and it was $28 in 19 and $24 in 20. So now we're back to your handout again. <clears throat> so I've tried to combine uh, two regional data into uh, two sets of data into one slide. So we've got 
On page 14 at the top, you'll have Southwest Minnesota on your handout. So this is from 2011 through 2019. This is the Finman data. This is the Farmers Records Delta Farm Management Program. This shows the average rental paid by those farmers from 2011, 168 up to in 2019 of 208. So you can see the trend was big numbers there for a couple of years, then it declined, declined, declined. And right now it's declined to $12 from 18 to 19 to 208. So that gives you the trend from the farmers records. Then you see a bold numbers here. Here's the USDA numbers from 19 and 20 from their surveys. So these are after the farmers actual records and these are from surveys completed. So they're saying 2019, the rate was 189 compared to the 208 we had in adult farm management. And then they're saying 2020 increased by $3 an acre to 192. Then you see an estimate of 2020, it's just an estimate. I have no idea if that's gonna be the guidelines, but in general, those are flat changes from 20 to 21. The only reason why they, they're gonna mirror the, the estimate for 2020 is no change unless there's a big discrepancy. Like here, there's a big discrepancy between the Finman data and the USDA. So I lowered the USDA number closer between. Here the same, here I raised it because there's a higher number for Pipestone. Here I left it lower. So again, but in general, I tried to keep the same. But again, these are just guidelines. And if you want the overall trend prediction for 2021 rental rates, it's gonna be flat. Okay, so unchanged from 2020. This table is not in your handout. It's not online. I just put it in here to kind of show you. Remember earlier I talked about how the corn and soybean prices really do control or really relate to the rental rates in Southern Minnesota. So let's just walk through it quick. Over here is the years 2000 to 2019. These are the average cash prices each year for corn and soybeans. For, for my, I'm using my Worthington numbers here. Over here, this is the average Southern Minnesota rents. Actually, those are the farmer prices I think I use over here instead of Worthington prices. These are the average rents paid each year by those 1,200 farms in Minnesota every year. See, and normally, historically, I'll tell you, rents slowly go up in the good times when prices are getting better economics. So you see there's just a steady gradual increase up to up here when they had the high prices in 2013, then they slowly go down. So I would tell you, they slowly go up and slowly go down depending on where the price is growing. This column shows you the percent change in prices in the previous year. So even though corn went up a penny, beans went down enough, the overall change was down 3.21%. So this column takes the previous year rent times the price change to get a forecasted rent. Takes the previous year rent times the price change to get a forecasted rent. So if, if the price of corn and beans reacted identically, these numbers would be the same. But you can see these numbers change up or down. Some years are much lower, some years are much higher. They're about, you know, they're much lower here, but down here they're higher. And they're much, they're much higher some years. So again, they really vary much higher there and much lower there. And that's because the price changes a lot. In three years, they had a 100% increase in the corn and bean price. They had a 48% increase in one year, 50%. But we had 24% decline and a 25% decline. So they really do vary. So they really jump around more, but they always go back to the previous year rents and the price change to get a forecast to rent. If those numbers did truly work out over time, these numbers would be the same. But you know, your rents are determined a lot of times in advance of where the prices are determined over here. So. But overall, if I take all these numbers in this column and all these numbers in this column and average them out, how close did they add together? I think there's $30 an acre difference, uh, 20, 25, 15, there's actually less than $1 difference. So over the long haul, these two numbers do really correspond. The corn and bean prices really translate into rental rates, but they just don't, they're not as volatile because there's, I tell you, rents steadily go up and steadily go down. That's kind of the trend they're on. The last column doesn't go back to the real rates every year. It starts with that benchmark at 98.31, takes the price change to get that forecast, takes that rent times the price change and gets that forecast. So these columns, I would argue, are more like the coffee shop rates that you hear about, and they are more reactive exactly to corn and bean prices. So you can see we had some, how they fluctuate from year to year, some big jumps, almost $100 change there and $60 change there. But look, what we had three years in a row above $300. And then we've been going down since the high price of corn and beans in 13, we've been going down. We had two years at Around 200. And last year in these budgets, I used $200. This year I'm using 205. But you see where it is right now. It says it's forecast at $213 an acre. That landlord worksheet, where'd that come in at? Remember that landlord, when, she, when Amber walked through the example, it came down to $213.78. So really close to this projection again. So again, just some guidelines to think about the corn, which kind of does show that corn and bean prices are really determined, uh, really help determine what the rental rates are over the long haul. Land values. Got two sources of data here, the National Statistics Service and Land Economics is a great website. But in order to figure out your land values, um, yields are a big factor in calculating your break-evens and also the value of your farm. 
So what is your farm's corn yield and what is your farm's bean yield? And what I want here is your five-year average for the last five years. What's your APH? What does APH mean? That's your actual production history for the last five years in your farm. That's what they, they have the crop insurance bushels. Those are bushels they can insure at the insurance agency. So again, uh, most that's private information for the farmers. It's their yields. FSA won't share it with you. The crop insurance agent won't share it with you. But you can request as a landlord on your lease agreement. But again, write down what you think your yields are for the last five years for your farm for corn and soybeans. Again, if you have any questions, put them in the chat or the Q&A. And, but we're going to keep plotting forward here. So if you go back to your handout, again, they're by region. So now that we're on page 16, and we're in the second set of numbers from 16. So we're talking about Slayton today, Murray County. These numbers are the yields that come from the USDA. They come out in February each year normally. And these are the same yields used for your government program payments. So what happened? Remember, you had a really wet year in 2019. Look at how much the corn yield dropped from 18 to 19. Almost 30 bushels of decline. Same thing in Nobles. We had those really wet spring down here. Redwood, big decline. So it was a bad year in 2019. But Lincoln, or Lincoln, we don't know, but Lyon County only lost three bushels that year. And because of that, Lyon County did not get ARC County payments for corn and soybeans because they didn't have the yield loss. Look at the bean yields are actually above. They went up. So again, Lyon County was one of those anomalies down here in southern Minnesota that, that didn't get those ARC County government payments. So it didn't, even the whole southwest didn't get, get across the board. But what it shows you here is for the five-year average, this was the yields every year comes up in February, and that was a five-year average. If I was, if I had land in Lincoln County, I didn't know what that NA was because they the county boards will figure out that yield, they'll plug a yield in there, but they didn't do the estimates when they came out for Pipestone and Lincoln. I would take the regional numbers here. So the regional numbers went down, you see 23 bushels. So I'd take the previous year number minus 23, and I would plot in an estimate there of 163. Minus 23 bushels there, I'd get an estimate there of 152. I'd, that's how I'd fill those numbers in, by based on the regional estimates. And then I could plot the five-year average. So I'd fill these NAs in. But again, you can do that if you want to, if you have land those counties. But we have one for Murray County. So there's a five-year average, 189 and 53. Pretty close to our sample farm of 190 and 52, isn't it? Just a little bit different on both of them. So if you're, how's those numbers compared to your farm? If your farm's above those by quite a bit, then you probably have above average land, maybe deserve a little bit above average rent. If you're able to below that, you probably deserve a little bit below average rents. And if you're close to this, maybe you have average rents that are good for you. But again, it gives you another way to measure how your farm's producing. And if you did a flexible lease, you can use county yields too, instead of your individual farms if, the, if they don't want to share them. But again, that's just another source of data for you that's out there that you can, you can find for your, to use yourself. Farmland value trends. I get asked you earlier if they're going up, down, or staying the same, but now I just want you to choose one of them. What do you think the trend is for land values? Are they going up? Are they going down? They remain the same. What do you think? Pick one. This chart is online at our extension website. It's, it'll be updated here as I get 2020 numbers. I don't have them yet, so you have to wait. I've only got eight counties so far of these. So we're still waiting for a few to get the data to me. But here it shows you, this is bare dirt. So we're talking about Murray County today. This is the average sale price for black dirt in Murray County from 2009 to 2019. It's for uh, no improvements, it's bare dirt, with no improvements. It's for sales that are more than 20 acres. They don't build in size, because they sell higher. It's got to be more than half cropland, so I want cropland sales, and it's got to be uh, to non-related parties. So that's those those things really do affect the prices. A predecessor of mine did this started in the 1990s. I he had six, and he went seven. I've doubled to 14 in 2005. So since then, we've been tracking these 14 counties. It shows you a trend for bare dirt. So here's Murray County's trend: reached a high here in 2013 at 8,452 dollars an acre. Declined, declined, went up, declined, went up and then declined. Those are the trend. I want to do a regional numbers to think about how the trends are statewide. Here shows the average for the whole 14 counties, how it went up and down and reached the high here in, in 13 as well. But where did it show from 18 to 19? Very little change. So $6,500 an acre, remember we used that in landlord worksheet, kind of comes from these numbers. That was the current sale price, average sale price for bare dirt. You look at the percent change for the whole region, you see there are big years of increases and four years of declines. Then it went up a little bit in 18, didn't change much in 19, down slightly. But it had big dollar moves here for a few years, both up and down. Normally, historically, I tell you, these would go up like one or 2% a year or down one or 2% per year, but they've got more, more volatile the last. So you can find this online. Um, I'll get 19 numbers, it will change to 20 when I get the numbers completed. 
if you look at 19 numbers, you'll see half of them are highlighted. Seven counties are highlighted in yellow and half of them are not highlighted. So what they show you, the highlighted cells went up from the year before. So if you're from one of those counties that were highlighted, which Murray County is not, but if you were from uh, Martin County, you'd say the land sale trend is up. Values are going up. So these seven counties, the trend is up. If you're one of the non-highlighted cells, you'd say that land value trends are going down. So here, right alone, you've got, you can answer yes or no, or you're up or down, depending on which county you're from. And if you use the regional numbers, they didn't change much. So you can say, stay the same. So right for this slide set, this one slide, I could answer yes to all three of those questions, depending on what county I'm gonna use or what data I'm gonna use. So it's kind of interesting how that works. Another source of data that you can all access, and I encourage you to use it after the workshop at your leisure on page 17 and 18, um, the whole state is listed by county in alphabetical order. I've got the slide here by region like we've been talking about, so you'll find Murray on page 18, towards the top. So what this shows you, this is from the Land Economics website. Uh, Steve Taff used to do it, now Bill Lasser's done it the last couple of years. And, and this data comes to him from, it gets it from through September of the county of auditors each year. So there were 12 sales in Murray County of ag property, like I talked about earlier. This was the average sale price in 2019. This is the average price in 2018, so they said they went down. This is the low average sale price in 19. This is the high average sale price in 19. So if you go to this website and you choose Murray County and you choose the average sale price per acre, you'll see by township all 12 of these sales. So you can find out which township that one's in, which township this one was in to give you an idea what land's selling for in your neighborhood where your land's located. So it's a great place to go. Landeconomics.uofm.edu shows you the sales. And this gets updated. The 20 numbers will come in online probably by March of next year. That's when they were there by this year. Uh, there were 19 numbers were there in March of this year. Gives you an idea, look at those numbers and you can see by township since 1990. So it's a great place to go and I encourage you to do that. But overall, Cottonwood went up, Jackson went down, Lincoln went up, Wine went up, uh, Murray went down, Nobles went up, Pipestone went up, Red was about the same, went down a little bit, and Cot Rock went down a little bit, and Rotten Lawn went up. Just like I showed you in my other data set, this is the whole calendar year, but so, and overall the whole state, those kind of goes along with our data set, the over average for the whole state didn't change much, but some kinds went up, some kinds went down, just like my Southwest number showed. Now let's turn a little bit and talk about flexible rental agreements. I've been encouraging these for several years. I've been doing these workshops for over 15 years. We started with about uh, less than 10% of the farms were flexible rental agreements, leases. Well, now we're probably over 20%. And so I encourage you to think about doing that. You can go to our extension website and see some examples. Um, it's also two pages in your handout. I've done several, I've got several hundred examples of this, but these are kind of some basic ways of doing it. You can do it based on gross revenue, do a base rent for the bonus, you can do a based on yield, you can do it based on price only or a profit sharing. If it, that's on page 20 and on page 19, your handout, you'll go back one page, you'll find this table. This is, I'm a numbers person. This has got a lot of numbers you can look at to figure out things, but from 1995 to 2019 are listed here. These are the average rents in 1200 farms in Minnesota. Remember how they gradually went up? We jumped over $100 an acre in 2002. We jumped over $200 an acre in 2013. And now we're going back towards $200 an acre. Okay, over here you see the price the farmers got, those 1,200 farms got to correspond to their, their rents paid. And I have two more columns I didn't put on the table, but that's their average yields. Take their average yields, times the average price, and I get these two columns, that's their gross, average gross revenue per corn and soybeans per acre. When I take the rent divided by the gross, and I get the highlighted sales, that's the percent of gross for corn and soybeans. That's a flexible lease agreement, percent of gross. So you can do this uh, every year. You can use the APH, the five-year actual yield production history, you can use the actual yields. Um, so you can use county yields, whatever you want to do, but you can use that, take it times a price. The price can be once a year, can be twice a year. Maybe use the spring and fall insurance prices. Maybe use quarterly prices. Maybe once a month, an average amount times the actual yield, the APH, and then times the percent of gross, you've got a gross lease agreement. You can see how if prices go up, the percent of gross goes down. If prices go down, the percent of gross goes up. So you can see I talked about an inputs so is about 30, 30 of the input costs go to rent on corn and about 40% on beans. Well, this year it was pretty same on gross. But for the 10 year average, it is 40% for corn or for soybeans and about 29% on corn. So let's look at an example using those figures. So if I use 29% for corn and 40% for soybeans, use my APH of 190 or the actual to 190, and I use a price of 350 by using our budget at 29%, there's the rent. If the price is $4 at 190 bushels, there's the rent, 29%. I use 450 for a price average. 
times it's 129%, there's the rent. All these examples have the price going up. I don't have any for the price going down. Well, what happens to the farmer? What's the farmer have for protection? If the price, the price goes down or yield goes down, they have crop insurance that can check for the price going down at, at whatever level of coverage they have. Not, not the top little bit, but after a certain point, they can insure their bushels and their prices. What's the landlord have for support if the price goes down? They have nothing unless they put in a base rent agreement, the base rent. So they can have, that'll put the floor or the rents can't go down to that base. Okay, so that would be there for, for the farmer, it's crop insurance level. So again, that protection for the floor and both for the landlord and the farmer. On being example at 40%, if it's two bushels, $9 price, there's the rent, $11, there's the rent, I'm sorry, $10, there's the rent, and $11 is 228. So you've got different examples there, percent of gross. It's pretty simple, okay? Percent of nets get a little more complicated. This is the profit available on the land. So the farmer pays his bills, hasn't paid himself anything, and hasn't paid the rent yet. That's the net income we'll generate off the land each year. And for corn, it hasn't worked out very good because we had five years in there with negative income for the farmer. But for beans, it, it comes out to about a third of the net goes to the, to the farmer and two thirds go to the rent. The corn budget of 21 indicates income of 665 and expenses before rent and labor of 530 per acre. That leaves a net of $135 to be shared between the farmer and the landlord and 190 bushels at 350. If we use that number, um, two thirds of that would be $89 an acre rent. Very low number compared to rents are today. For, for soybeans, that's the income projection Without rent and labor, that's expenses. So that leaves a net of 171 to be shared. Two thirds going to rent would be 113. Take those numbers and average them out, that's about $100 an acre rent. Again, doesn't work well in 2021. So you don't see very many of these agreements right now because there's not a lot of net to share right now. Here's where I get those numbers. This is my 1200 farm in Southern Minnesota. Shows their labor charge and net income that the farmer keeps, adds up to the farmer's share and the rent, that's the landlord's share. So you take the percentage of those two numbers. You see the farmer got more than half for quite a few years, a couple of years about half and half in 2008 and more than half these three years. But then we had five years where they had losses. In those five years they had losses, the rent was more than the income off the land. So the, land, the rent was actually more than 100% of the net income each of those five years. So that really skewed the 15 year average over here and really skewed the 10 year average, not the one third, two thirds. But on soybeans, it was much more closer to those numbers. So, so unlike corn, soybeans did not have a very, had a little loss here in 14, but most of the time it had income every year, so they didn't have those losses. And the, the 15 year average is really close to the 33 and 40, 66, and so is the 10 year average. So that's sharing the net. This is one of the simple lease agreements to see. This is probably the most basic and most common. It's just a set bushels per acre. You can do it flexible by a percent of the crop, like a third of the crop for both corn and beans. It can be more of the bean bushels, whatever you wanna do, but just a set bushels. If you use the APH, you can adjust that accordingly. It's gonna be, it's going to vary less because if like this year we had good yields and last year had poor yields, well, the rent could really go down last year and really could go up this year. But if I'm a landlord, I might want more consistent income. So if I use the APH, um, my rent 